Good morning, good morning. Is it, is it, oh, is it afternoon? Okay, good. Things change here because I was supposed to be on a panel, um, and now they asked me to speak. So I said, what do you want me to speak on? And they said anything. So I want to talk about something that's close to my heart, which is entrepreneurship. And has anyone seen me speak before? Yeah, you have. What do I do now? Huh? Take my shoes off. That's right. I never speak with my shoes on. And I, always have, and, and I wasn't expecting to speak today, so lucky I've got some fancy shoes on. Oh, uh, socks. All right. How many of you here, I can't see any of you. This is great for, for nerves. How many of you are, entre are entrepreneurs? How many of you are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur? Hey, shame, man. Shame. <laughs> All right. I'm going to talk to you about something that's close to my heart, which is entrepreneurship. And there's a statistic in entrepreneurship that 96% of all businesses will fail within a 10-year period. 96% of all businesses that start out today will not be around in 10 years' time. And I've spent the last 20 years trying to understand the difference between the 4% that succeed and the 96% that fail. What is the difference in terms of how they act, what they do, how they think, etc.? Now... You saw what happened today. I was supposed to be sitting on a panel talking about uh, uh, ownership, owning your own accountability, and then I was given this opportunity to come speak right now. You all have heard of this damn thing called the business plan, right? Yeah. I only ever get uh, invited to speak for a bank once, okay, ever. They, kind of, they invite me once, I speak, they never invite me again. Because I talk about this thing called the business plan, which is absolute BS. Can I say bullshit here? Okay. It's absolute bullshit. If you look at the history of business plans, I'm gonna, I want to dispel some of the myths around entrepreneurship. If you look at the history of business plans, business plans were actually created in the 60s, late 60s, by the American banking system that used to in the past, used to be able to lend out money. There was the bank manager. They knew the community. Little Bobby came and asked for some money for a tractor. They know Bobby's father, and they gave Bobby some money to buy a tractor. But as the bank started to expand, they needed a different mechanism to check because the, business, the bank manager didn't know who Bobby was anymore. So they created a checklist, which then became this thing called a business plan. Now, there are three pieces of research that show that there is absolutely no correlation between a business plan and business success. In fact, one of them, in 1994, shows a negative correlation between a business plan and business success. In fact, if you have a business plan, that you're more likely to fail. <laughs> I can go into that reason a little later. So I love it when entrepreneurs come to me and they come with this business plan and they come and ask to see me, and they come sit down, and, I say, and they put this document on my desk, okay, and it's still warm. You know that photostat warmth paper has got a certain photostat warmth. You can still see, it, see feel it. It's got that, like, nice warmth that you love to feel in winter especially. And I say to them, how do you make money? And they say, it's in there. It's in that document. It's in there. And I take that document... And I tear it in half in front of them, and I w watch their eyes go like this. And I say, okay, now that you don't have that document, tell me how you make money. How does 100 Rand become 120 Rand? And if they can't answer that question, then I'm not investing in that individual. Because the answer to whether a business will succeed or fail doesn't lie in a document. It lies in the character of the entrepreneur. It lies in the ability to see obstacles and navigate around them. It, it lies in their ability to see opportunity on the way on their journey as an entrepreneur. So this damn document, which always looks the same. Year one, I need lots of money. Year two, I need lots, lots more money. And year three, it just always does that curve. And if you want to know how to do a business plan, you do put your name in Calibri Fund 14 right in the thing and just draw a J. Because in year three, you're going to make so much money. And in the body of your business plan, you're going to write, I need 2 million rand to build a warehouse. And I'm going to say to you, what do you need to build a warehouse for? 
all the money. I don't trust the banks with that much money. Okay. They all look the same, yet 96% of them fail. So it cannot be, it cannot be the method by which we determine success or failure. And I've spent the last 18 years within RaceCorp working with entrepreneurs, trying to discern what it is uh, that makes the ones actually become part of the 4% and the others 96%. So here are a couple of things that I want to share with you today in the few minutes that I've been given. The first thing that I look for, here is I'm going to give you some weird ones today. Father issues. How many of you got issues with your father? Come on, put up your hand. He says you put very shy, shy, shy. Now I'm going to ask you to tell you some information. Okay. It's unequivocally proven that if you have a father issue, if your father is absent emotionally or physically, i.e. death, divorced, they moved somewhere, that you're far more likely to become a successful entrepreneur. Okay, far more likely. And if you have an overdoting mother with an absent father, that's just the perfect combination. Now let me ask you, ladies and gentlemen, how many of you got father issues right now? Yeah, all of you know, huh? Okay. And why I say that is because people don't understand what is actually enabling and what is the mythology in entrepreneurship in South Africa and across the world. What are the myths that we believe? And when an entrepreneur, when I ask them, so do you have father issues? And they go, yes. I say, please come to the front of the queue because you are definitely going to be a winner for me. Okay. Father issues. So those of you who think that your father issues was a problem, I now want to release you from that. Okay. You've heard many entrepreneurial gurus come up and they'll come, especially the American ones. Are there any Americans in the audience here today? Anyway, yeah, I'm going to try and put an American accent on. Please do not judge me, okay? And this is what's going to happen when you come to an entrepreneurial session. They're going to have some guy coming up and he's going to be rah, rah, and all pumped up. And he's going to go, if you're going to be a successful entrepreneur, you've got to have passion, man. You've got to have passion. Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. Okay. Because I see entrepreneurs who are in IT and I say, what are you passionate about? They go, I'm very passionate about IT. <laughs> the zeros, the ones, the box, the wires, what is it that you're passionate about? We've got a, we've got a guy in Racecorp who's got a funeral home business. And I say to him, Vizzy, what are you passionate about? He goes, dead people. I go, yeah, <laughs> sure, bud. Now, the why I say this is because when we are given this, this, all this stuff that we're supposed to be like, that we try and be those people. So when we are in a certain business, we say, we retrofit what we do into what we say we're passionate about. So listen to me carefully. I am not saying don't be passionate. I'm saying express your own passion in the business that you're in. I'm in the business incubation space. I am not passionate about business incubation. In fact, two years into my journey as an entrepreneur as, uh, in, in Race Corp, somebody at a bri asked me what I did, and I was explaining, they said, ah, you run an incubator. I went, yeah, I never heard the term. Never heard the term before. So I am not passionate about business incubation. I'm passionate about something else, which is people development. I express that in my business. So please do not lie to yourselves and just retrofit what you do and what you say as I'm passionate about that because you're told that that's what you've got to do. When we look for entrepreneurs, you will, if you apply to, to, to Race Group, you will go through a whole testing process. We never ask you for a business plan anywhere in that. One of the... One of the test is called the ILC test, internal locus of control. In other words, how much of your future do you believe you've got control over? And we only take entrepreneurs who sit within a band of, in, in our calculation, 12 to 16. If they are 11, they have what we call an external locus of control. If they are 17, they have a too high internal locus of control. All the entrepreneurs in the room know this, that life just happens. You wake up one day, you've got all your plans, and then somebody doesn't come to work. You've got all your plans, you've got this big meeting, and you get the cancellation. You've got all these plans to come and be on a panel, and then you're asked to do a talk. Every, every, every day you get thrown all these different things. 
If you are too rigid, if you feel you're in control of everything, that when you're pl placed in front of something that is random, you actually freeze like a deer in, in, in the spotlight. So we don't like those entrepreneurs. They, too, they need too much control. Ask yourself this question, where do I live on some scale of 0 to 20? I've only got a few more minutes, so I just want to share a couple of few, few other things here with you. When you look at that statistic of 96% failing, 90% of that 96, there's a, there's a research firm called Brad and Dunn Street in the US, which shows that 90% of all businesses that shut down, close down, shut down or close down voluntarily. In other words, they wake up one morning and they say, I cannot do it anymore. Now, can you imagine if those people push through? How many, how many of you, how many of you have wanted to give up, woken up one morning and, as an entrepreneur and wanted to give up? All those who are not putting up your hand, you are liars, <laughs> lying bastards. Because you know, you know that, that you've, in the last week, the last month, that that's what we all do. All entrepreneurs, myself, many times, have woken up in the morning and saying that I, I want to give up. But the ones that push through are the ones that fall far, part of the 4%. And in the research, it shows that in that 4%, every single person who actually wanted, uh, who became successful, actually has wanted to give up on many, many occasions. And there's, a guy, there's this guy you, we were talking about, MassMart earlier. I saw Lebo talking about MassMart earlier. Walmart which is uh, Sam Walton started. He was interviewed. He was, a, at one point, the richest family in the world. He was asked the question, did you, sir, ever want to give up? And he said, yes, I want to, wanted to give up many times. And he said, well, why d didn't you give up? And he tells a story of the fact that his father was working for a bank during the Great Depression in America. And his father's role was to go and repossess homes and farms from people who hadn't paid their mortgage, their bond. And as a little boy, Sam Walton said to his dad, Daddy, Daddy, can I come see what you do? And, so, and he didn't relent, and finally, the, Sam Walton gets a chance to go and see what his father does. And he's, he tells a story how he watched his father go now to repossess, uh, repossess these farms and homes, and he watched these grown men drop to their knees in front of his father and beg his father not to take away their farm or home that had been in their family for generations. And he watched the children of these men watch their father beg to his father. And he swore to himself at that point that he would never, ever be in that position. So he said whenever he wanted to give up, he was able to go back into his memory and play that movie again, okay, and push himself through that. So they call it neg negative psychological drivers. Now, each one of us here has got a negative psychological driver. We don't want to be poor. We don't want to lose something. You want your, your family to be wealthier than you grew up. We've all got those things. The successful entrepreneurs, in terms of one of their character traits, is they're able at any point to switch on that video machine or that DVD or now whatever the digital version of that, that YouTube channel in their head. Okay? They switch it on and they play it every time they want to give up. Do you have that ability to play that YouTube clip of your negative psychological driver? One last tip, because I haven't got the five minute yet, so I'm keep going until I get the five minute. I got the five minute. <laughs> the ability to reframe your situation, to ask different questions. I'm often asked um, a question: When is the right time to give up? Okay, when, like, there must be some point when you give up. And when it comes to entrepreneurship, I'm pro-life. I want entrepreneurs to push through that dark moment. And here's the, here's the basic rule for me. If you are unable to ask different questions and get different answers, okay, that is the time to give up. And what I do is I have an ability to ask completely weird and wonderful questions. I call them shift questions. And for those of you who got uh, your pen and paper, write down my Twitter account, A-L-L-O-N-R-A-I-Z, Twitter for Baba, A-L-L-O-N-R-A-I-Z, and I post some of these questions that you can ask yourself um, from time to time. So one, one example now as I end off 
is an example, a question that I ask, ask in, in, when I work with entrepreneurs is, what would you do differently if your business only ran from 6 p.m. at night to 6 a.m. in the morning, and everyone else ran according to normal time? But you could only start your business at 6 p.m. and close at 6 a.m. How would you run your business differently? And some people say, well, you can't. It's impossible. Well, all my clients, are, I said, I know that you think that, but how would you run it differently? Oh, I would have to go into new markets. Okay, which new markets? I'd have to go into a different time zone. Why can't you do that now? Okay. Oh, I would have to delegate more because I, why can't you do that now? And they start getting different answers to their questions. Another question you can ask yourself, for example, is what would be different if you served food at every single interaction with your client? Now, that's a weird one, and forget the fact that I know the first answer is I'll get fat. Okay, we get that. Get rid of all those things. But how would it be change your interaction? What? And then you start getting different answers. Another question, and this is an interesting one, because I've worked with the Quasa, which is the Quadriplegic and Paraplegic Association of South Africa, and, and I asked them the reverse question. But I asked able, uh, able-bodied audiences, what would be different if you oh, were in a wheelchair, if you were quadriplegic? How would you run your business differently? And people say, well, I'd have to find better managers. I'd have to you know, delegate more. I'd have to do this, that, and the other. And then I look at them and I go, and why do you have to be in a wheelchair before you do that? Why can you not do that now? Now, the ability to ask these weird questions that come in at a different angle give you an opportunity to think differently about your business. So all of you, when you are in those dark moments, when you are wanting to give up, okay, I beg you not to. We need every single one of your entrepreneurs in this country to build this economy. Do not give up. Do not form part of that 96%. Do not form part of the 90% who give up. Push through. We need you. Thank you very much.